Okay, good afternoon. Um, thanks to RVA SEC for having us, and we want to thank you all for coming. This talk is Real World Intrusion Response Lessons from the Trenches. Um, first, a disclaimer um, all the opinions expressed in this presentation are our own. We're speaking for ourselves, not on behalf of GE, nor anyone or anything else. My name is Catherine Tramey. I'm currently an analyst on the GE CERT Advanced Threats team. Prior to that, I worked as an intelligence analyst with the Hampton, Virginia Police Division for about five years. I worked in tactical and operational intelligence and computer forensics. Uh, hello there. I am David Sharp. For the past 19 years, I've, I started off in IT security and, um, about nine years ago. Uh, 19 years ago, I started off in IT and systems programming. Uh, for the past three years, I worked for GE CERT and the Advanced Threats Team. So both of us are currently incident responders in GE CERT's Advanced Threats Team. We're responsible for finding and ejecting high-end intruders from GE's network. Specifically, our team focuses on stopping attempts to steal GE's intellectual property. Like many other companies, GE has to deal with actors, including foreign military, foreign intelligence services, and others, trying to take advantage of GE's research and innovations for the economic benefit of those that they serve. GE CERT and our colleagues across GE protect against that. For those not familiar with GE CERT, just a little bit of background. GE CERT provides incident response services for over 300,000 employees and over half a million endpoints globally. Since the team was founded in 2007, its approach to incident response was that, based on the concept of defenses fail, so you want to get really, really good at detection and incident response. And the early GE CERT team did exactly that. Even with limited resources, the early GE CERT built the original team and systems to be successful. That approach and philosophy worked very well and still serves us well today. What today's GE CERT is doing is building on that great foundation. We're taking the best from the past and making it even better. The purpose of this talk is to share a series of lessons learned from attacks that we've worked over the years. We hope that you can take any ideas from this presentation back to your own organizations. So let's get started. Um, this graphic roughly shows our process, and it's very much like what every CERT is doing in some form or another. We work in the response area, and we're directly affected in one way or another by everything that happens in this entire process. So this is going to be the roadmap that we use for the talk, stopping along the way to point out items that we think are of particular interest. We know not everybody in this room works for incident response, so we've selected items from every stage of the process so that we would have something of value for everyone. Just a quick overview of the process. At a high level, it's as simple as it looks. The step mark prepare represents our steady state. That's where we operate normally and where we're documenting, training, and continuously improving our processes. Uh, next, very quickly, harvested intelligence gets deployed as detection. Anything of concern arising from detection runs through our response processes. And learnings from response are then fed into prevention. And once the dust settles down from an incident, we then cycle back to our steady state of readiness and preparation. And at the heart of it all is a group of really great people. So how are we doing all of this? While it may be true that even the best defenses will sometimes fail, we're here to tell you today that for certain, the organizations that execute well in each area of this process fail less. In a sense, our goal in GE Search should be eventually to put ourselves out of business. However, the reality is that we might never fully get there. A significant portion of the economies of some countries depend on economic espionage or cybercrime. So there's no shortage of malicious activity right there, out right there, out there right now to deal with, and that's where we come in. So we're going to get started by talking about a few trends we've observed recently. Um, but first, how can you defend yourself properly if you don't know how your intruders are normally getting in? Keeping abreast of trends should be part of your ongoing preparation. So what is happening out there right now? Since 2011, the three primary ways we see hostile actions directed toward us are, number one, penetration of some internet-facing asset. Since 2011, that's been the source of 63% of our workload. Number two is watering hole attacks. Since 2011, that's caused 27% of our workload. And number three, spear phishing. About 10% of the issues we've worked have risen from targeted, targeted 
spear phishing attacks. For the 63% portion, that refers to mostly straight hacking of internet-facing websites, not firewalls, routers, or load balancers, or anything like that. You want to think PHP, Cold Fusion, SAP, vulnerabilities in custom applications, Joomla, et cetera. Anything that is possibly remotely exploitable from over the internet, if not unpatched or unmitigated in some way. What you typically see in this bucket of activity is the actor finds a writable hole in some application, uploads a web shell through that hole, and then uses the web shell to upload additional tools, dump system credentials, conduct further recon, and move laterally further inside your organization. The 27% portion, which is watering hole attacks, breaks down into two pieces. Classically, from an AT APT perspective, watering holes, which are also called strategic web compromises, were typically where an actor would compromise a website where employees of intended victim organizations might go as part of their, their normal job duties. Places like engineering websites or conference or other professional organization websites. But think about the VFW.org compromise from early 2014 that was in the news recently. If you're not familiar with that, that is the Veteran of Foreign Wars organization's website. The VFW.org site was compromised in serving up APT mal malware onto victim machines. That was a little bit different since that's a site intended for a broader set of people across the general public. So it's a much bigger net compared to classic watering hole attacks in that it would catch a lot of people, not just people like defense contractors, sitting at their desks at work. And that might have compromised not just people's homes, home machines, but not just, that might have compromised their home machine, not just their work machine. So do incidents like the, v, the VFW.org compromise hint in a new tactic? Are APT co compromises from more widely used public sites being added into the mix? Lastly, for the 10% portion, which is targeted spear phishing, we should mention that we saw a steep drop off in early 2013 in the volume of APT spear phishing activity. That lasted for several months, but has risen again to closer to normal historic volume in 2014. Another trend we see is attacks through trusted third parties. And by third party, we mean partner organizations and vendors who are somehow connected to your network. If you're running a well-defended network, we find that intruders start looking to your possibly less well-defended partners and vendors for possible ways in. They might also start looking at your new company acquisitions. Maybe those organizations don't have the same money and people resources that you do. So if that's your reality, you need to learn how to manage those situations. How are they initially getting into these third parties? In our experience, it's pretty much the same mix of techniques that we mentioned in the prior slide that we see used against us. Meaning specifically, we might see a third party website get compromised with lateral movement from that initial entry point in toward us. Or it could be a client machine within the third party organization that was compromised via a phishing or watering hole attack and then used as a pivot point to move inside again toward us. Another trend we're seeing is hostile Microsoft documents. In cases involving targeted spear phishing, malicious office documents took the number one spot for us back in 2012 and have held that position ever since. Adobe PDFs used to hold that number one spot, but those have dropped off considerably for us in recent years. Specifically, we see one CVE right now, CVE 2012-0158, that we've seen used against us and others repeatedly. And we're going to discuss that a little bit more when we talk about prevention. Java. Java remains a problem for many organizations. And by Java, we mean primarily client-side Java runtimes on Windows machines, not so much server-side Java. Internet-wide in 2014, some vendors are reporting Java being a component in malicious activity involving IT assets over 90% of the time. And we see a similarly lopsided proportion of attacks involving Java. This trend started a few years ago, but got more progressively weighted on the Java side around 2012 and has remained that way for us now into 2014. This is a true statement, both in the APT area where David and I work, as well as on the cybercrime and general malware side of our organization. On the screen, we have a list of 17 Java CVEs from the Contagio malware site that we commonly see used against us. And we've seen roughly one-third of these CVEs used on the APT side over the past couple of years, so about a half dozen out of the whole list. 
By way of illustration, this chart is from Microsoft's most recent security intelligence report from May 2014. It's based on exploit kit data from the Contagio malware site. What this chart shows is a breakdown of exploit types grouped by technology from the years 2006 through 2013. The lighter shade of blue at the bottom represents Java exploits. So you can clearly see a steep upward trend in favor of Java in recent years. Looking at 2013, the bar on the far right, you also see Adobe Reader, which is the orange in the chart, dropping off considerably. Adobe Flash is still in the mix a little bit, which is the red box at the top. And Internet Explorer is still there, which is the green box in the middle. From a targeted attack experience or perspective, our experience is very much like this. We probably encounter many of the IE zero days ever discussed in one form or another along with a lot of Java exploitation attempts with some Adobe Flash mixed in here and there. And we'll talk a little bit more on how to handle Java later. The final trend we wanted to touch on briefly is that we've seen an increase recently in the amount of malicious activity being redirected at our people outside of work, mostly using LinkedIn and Facebook. The ultimate purpose of this activity appears to be to connect with the intended target in order to directly social engineer information out of them. Our experience is a little bit different from what's been discussed in the news recently. There were some public reports that described themes mostly based on fake journalists or defense workers. We see cases where an actor might approach an engineer outside of those professions through social media and attempt to befriend them as a technical peer and then start asking them for sensitive documents about their work. So this is a tough one since it might be happening off your network. Uh, what do you do about this? Well, here are a couple ideas. Number one, you maybe want to have a clearly defined way for your employees to raise any concerns they've encountered to your security staff. Number two, maybe include a mention of this trend in any security awareness training that you have. And number three, maybe you want to start thinking about the health of your employees' home machines. So considering this trend alongside with the trend we touched on earlier with the VFW.org site, which affects a broader range of people outside of work, um, are people's home machines becoming a new or renewed frontier, APT frontier in 2014? This might be something you want to keep in mind if you're considering BYOD or bring your own device. Next, I'm on, next up in our process is Intel. Actionable, high quality intelligence is a starting point of our process. So what do we mean by high quality Intel? This chart helps illustrate what we mean. We've broken down different indicator types by how useful and reliable they are at finding malicious activity. And by indicators, basically we mean things you can look for on your networks that might help provide a sign that something malicious is going on. At first, it might sound right to scoop up every piece of intel you ever see and roll that all out as detection. However, there are a couple problems with that approach. First, someone has to process all of those alerts, and you don't want to flood people with a lot of false positives. Uh, if you do that, alerts for real intrusions might get lost in that crowd. Secondly, many detection systems have limited capacity. So once you go from dozens of indicators to hundreds to thousands, sometimes your detection systems can't keep up. The very best indicators in our experience are those that loose, fall loosely into a few categories. Those are the ones that we list in the top row in the chart as best. First are ones that are more difficult for intruders to change, like how their tools and malware work and how that intruder's actions appear on the network. Secondly, indicators that are related to hot current activity. So a great example of this would be IP addresses and domain names from a, a very recently discovered APT watering hole attack, an attack that is currently active and underway. Third, indicators related to highly active APT actors. The second and third rows of the chart contain indicator types that we consider of somewhat lesser value. And to be clear, just because something appears lower in the chart does not mean it is worthless, especially if it's seen alongside other indicators at its level or other levels. Um, if you have the means, the resources, and the system capacity to collect and detect on everything, that's obviously more desirable, and it's going to give you the best possible results. However, if you cannot cover everything or you're just starting out, we might suggest that you start from the top of this chart at best and work your way down, not from the bottom up. The indicator types that are listed under best to us prove the most reliable and stand the test of time far better. 
In fact, we have detection built from 2009 and prior intel from this best category that still finds intrusions in 2014. On the other hand, IP addresses and domain names from a phishing attempt that happened only once several years ago and that have not been reused since, do you really want to keep detection deployed for those? And file name hashes, file names and file hashes can be pretty trivially changed by attackers, so is that something you really want to focus your attention on? However, things like tools and malware operate might require expensive and difficult recoding, and so they're generally going to be more effective for detection. Likewise, detection around hacker techniques and tactics are going to stand the test of time far better, and for us, prove to be good choices for detection. Next, we're going to talk about the hot topic of intelligence sharing between organizations. Everyone talks about the value of shared intelligence, but what's really working out there in the real world? We'll begin by saying that a significant percentage of our workload started with shared intel. And what we mean by that is that the thing that alerted us to something being wrong in our, ne in our network wasn't always a piece of internal intel, but something that was shared with us by an outside party. That isn't always the case. We also have a huge repository of internal intel that works well for us, too. We recommend that you avail yourself of any ISACs or information sharing and analysis centers or similar organizations that are relevant to your industry. To be honest, we find wide variations in intel and the quality of, quality of intel that we get from various sources, but we make sure we mine all of them just to be safe. In our experience, information sharing services from industry groups are really effective. The US Defense Industrial Base pretty much has this down with something called DSIE, or the Defense Security Information Exchange. In our opinion, DSIE should be used as a model for other intelligence sharing resources. What makes DSIE valuable is the people and its design, because its design promotes trust between partners. While on the subject of shared intel, we personally recommend the creation of a DSIE-like equivalent for the energy sector. While absolutely everybody in this room can use better intel sharing in their industries, if we personally could ask for just one thing, it would be something as good as DSIE for the energy sector. So where do you want to keep or store all of your intelligence? We use something called CRITS, or Collaborative Research into Threats. This is a, um, an information management tool from MITRE. And it's what we use at GE for managing our body of intelligence. A shared repository like this is much better than private collections of intel that either aren't shared or private collections that leave when key personnel leave or change jobs. So you want to have that intel centrally stored and managed. Additionally, CRITS went open source this week, so anyone can download it. So this might sound a little crazy, but after a while, you find yourself with too much intel. You might come to that realization when the people processing your alerts can't keep up or they start complaining about the volume of po false positives. Or you might find out when you start having system detection, system capacity problems in your detection systems. So if this happens to you, you might want to consider having an indicator reputation scoring system to whittle down the number of indicators over time and address any performance issues across monitoring systems that might arise and to help your false positives getting out of control. Using a reputation scoring system that allows indicators to have little or no chance of finding anything to be aged out over time. So going back to our earlier chart, we're suggesting that if you need to age out indicators, maybe you want to give the proven higher fidelity indicators in your best category a pass. Maybe make them exempt from the reputation scoring system. Anything that's in your good or limited categories can have their reputation scores lowered over time to a point where they might be removed from your detection systems entirely if they never fire. Or when they do fire, they never find anything actionable. Can you hear me okay? This brings us to detection. This is where we take actionable indicators from our intel intelligence collection processes and deploy them out into production to look for signs of similar activity. What works better for detecting intrusions, network data or host data? For us, it isn't just one thing, it is a mix. Considering our entire data set from the founding of GE CERT through to today, roughly 80% of the time we find an intrusion that was from our company-wide network monitoring. The other 20% of the time, we find intrusions through other means, mostly AV logs, web proxy hits, or host detection. 
Having all these logs flow into a central, reliable, and easily searchable repository helps. Remember this chart from before? Simply put, for us, the best intel makes for the best detection. Again, the most reliable indicators for detection purposes are the ones from the topmost layers, movements of tools, signs common attacker tools are being ran, and so forth. Things firing in tandem are especially powerful, so if you have a way to correlate alerts to see what is firing together that may be related, that is highly useful. Again, just because an indicator falls in the bottom row doesn't make it always useless, especially if it gets correlated with something else that is of higher fidelity. For example, we had an incident recently that we found because a high fidelity user agent string from a known custom attacker tool from the best section fired alongside an alert for a known hostile domain from the bottom or limited section. When we considered these two together, that drew our attention and was more concerning. Now, let's walk through a detection idea that we think might work for all of you. A large percentage of intrusions involve the use of password dumping tools at some point. What we mean is that an intruder successfully fished you or maybe breached a website. To work their way further into your environment, they may dump the credentials of all logged in users on the machine they compromised, hoping to find an account with broader access. This is an attack pattern we have seen consistently over the years. So, if password dumping happens so often as part of intrusions, why not constantly watch for signs of those tools being present or being used? How do you do that? The five password dumping tools that we most commonly see used in real attacks are WCE, PW dump, GSEC dump, FG dump, and Mimikatz, pretty much in that order. These are all tools that you can freely download for yourself. Does your IT staff or anyone regularly run any of these tools in production? In our experience, probably not, aside from the occasional IT administrator or IT auditor. So they make good choices for detecting intruder activity. Consider looking for these tools in at least three ways. One, look, at, look for them moving over the network in clear text, for example, over SMB connections. Two, look for signs one of the tools actually ran on a host machine. Three, look for signs your antivirus detected and removed one of them. We have cut, caught attacks these ways. They work. To be clear, sometimes we see these tools as they were downloaded, and sometimes we see them slightly modified by the attacker. As long as you stay away from alerting on something easily changed, like the file names or MD5 hashes, and focus on how the tools work, or something that is very difficult or expensive for the attacker to change, you can more, rely, you can more reliably use this technique for detection purposes. First, to look for the tools moving over the network in clear text, consider alerting on a unique string or byte sequence in the binary. Some people use embedded copyright strings, unique error message strings, or tool command line usage strings. That approach is fine, but something not easily editable usually works better. When we do see these tools altered by attackers, often they have blanked out the strings in it. So please keep that in mind when building your detection. Second, do one of the tools run? What is one way that you can look for execution attempts for each of these tools? Get a copy of all versions of all of these credential dumpers and run them. Does your AV vendor's host IPS solution log anything these tools do when successfully ran? What kind of things might you look for in your HIPS logs? Consider these examples for starters. One, all recent WCE versions attempt to load a DLL into the LSASS process out of temp. If you see that happening, someone probably tried to run WCE on your network. Two, FG dump loads a copy of PW dump out of temp. If you see this, someone tried to run FG dump on your network. Third example, look for unusual processes that open a process handle to the LSASS process. This technique is good for finding GSEC dump and Mimikatz. Both of these tools can dump and an analyze LSASS's memory space directly. By the way, thanks to Rob Fuller for this idea. So, try to cover these cases with a custom HIPS rule for at least alerting and preferably blocking and alerting. And lastly, find your antivirus street names for all versions of all of these tools. If an attack has progressed far enough along to where an intruder could dump credentials, don't you want to know about that even if AV ate their first attempt to run the tool? They are still inside of your network, right? So, see what your antivirus calls each on detection. If all else fails, upload them all to VirusTotal and see what your AV vendors report for each. Then consider setting up alerting for AV log hits for those unique street names. 
These three password dumping tool detection techniques should last you years. But you do need to be aware when new versions of these tools come out or new password dumping tools get released. You will need to test these new tools, these new versions, and adjust your detection accordingly. Something else to keep in mind. For some types of detection, you simply cannot just roll it out and never think about it again. We already talked about maintaining the detection of the, for the password dumping tools. You might also have to periodically review existing deploy detection that is based on things like file format specifications and specifics of how application protocols work. Sometimes specifications and protocols change over time, and you need to maintain legacy detection that might rely on those specifications. We would like to share a couple examples to illustrate what we mean by this. First, first example, the RAR archive file format changed recently. The RAR file header was, for a long time, from versions 1.5 through 4, seven bytes long, and looked, like, and looked like what you see on screen in the top portion of the slide. But it changed recently, moving to eight bytes with the version 5 specification. That is a problem if you process fields after that header in your detection. Why would you process fields after that header? If your intel tells you intruders tend, to intruders tend to configure their RAR files a certain way, for example, they commonly encrypt them, then you must look past the RAR header to see if the right fields are set in the RAR file. If you built that detection years ago and don't periodically review it, you won't see that there is a version 5 of the RAR file specification in the first place, and your detection won't work properly as some intruders move to RAR version 5 over time. Another example, Microsoft's SMB protocol. The SMB protocol has changed over the years. SMB v2 was released in 2006. SMB v3 was released with Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012. There was also an SMB version 2.1 and version 3.02 to consider. If, for example, you have detection for intruders that execute remote commands over the wire by first getting the remote time of a target system through SMB, then chasing that with a, a remote SMB at job request, you need to make sure that you cover all SMB versions and all combinations of SMB versions in your testing. What we have found is that, is that some fields moved a little from one version to another, and that threw off some older but high fidelity detection. The point is to make sure that your detection is still accurate as newer versions of important protocols get released. A few final thoughts on detection. First, if you deploy an application whitelisting solution on key systems like domain controllers, treasury systems, and so forth, can you detect on what application whitelisting blocks? For example, would you want to know if a PSExec-like execution attempt happened on one of those lockdown systems? Second, can you mine your discovered software asset inventory data for known problem file names, service names, and device drivers? Likewise, can you mine the data discovered from your vulnerability scans for remnants of intrusions? For example, any known bad service names or device driver names that may have been discovered as part of normal vulnerability scans. How about auto runs? Consider running sysinternals auto runs across all your Windows endpoints and centrally logging the results. You will catch a lot of general, AP, uh, general malware in this net, but some APT malware persists using the same auto runs locations as non-APT malware. Lastly, looking down the road a bit, we need a way to tell if the BIOSes and firmware on our endpoints have been compromised. MITRE's Copernicus project might be something to look at for detection. There are some vendors out there working on this problem as well. We need to solve the trusted computing-based problem. Next, we will discuss our response function, where we work. To help us all get oriented on the subject of response, we think it is helpful to always keep in mind what you're up against on the APT side, roughly at a very high level. Some information that you have is deemed interesting by an outside party. An intelligence officer tasks an operator to collect this information. The operator attempts to breach the target, move laterally once inside, and lastly co collect the requested data. The operator can be one person, a team, or groups of specialized teams. The skill levels of operators vary widely, ranging from amazingly effective PhD level down to more junior skill levels. A couple things to keep in mind, not every APT operator is elite, and high value targets typically get the best teams assigned. To help describe how we approach response, we would like to try a slightly different approach. That is by lining up a few attacker best practices for you, and then showing how, we, how, you, how, then showing you how we think or react to each of those. First, them, as the attacker. 
The initial breach always makes the most noise. Did someone hear me when I entered? Us, as responders. Any one alert might be our only shot at finding an intrusion. Process alerts quickly, respond quickly, contain affected systems quickly. More brains are better than one to determine what happened and to scope the intrusion. Keep in mind that you too might be being watched, and the attacker can, and often will, change tactics if they think you, they have been detected. A word of caution, on their advice to contain quickly. Not all organizations will agree with this. We move to contain quickly, normally. It depends on your circumstances, so work, work out your organization's IR approach beforehand. Another point to keep in mind, sometimes if an intruder has been around a long time and they control several machines in your environment with multiple ways in and out, it may be necessary to coordinate kicking them out all at once, not one machine at a time. If the attacker just has a small foothold and you detect that early, that is what we're talking about here. Next, them as the attacker. Moving slowly gets you caught earlier and more often. You need a plan before the initial breach is attempted and you need to manage your time on target effectively. Don't breach, then take a break. Don't breach, then continue tomorrow or your next workday. Progress the attack to the next stage immediately, complete the mission, and get out. Us, speed. Speed of response minimizes damage. Halt the intruder's progress as quickly as possible. If your adversary span the globe, you must be on watch 24 hours a day and must be in a position to respond effectively 24 hours a day. Make sure you quickly find all tools used to automate recon, lateral movement, etc., by the intruder. Get detection deployed out as soon as possible to fully sweep your environment. Repeat as new indicators are found. Next, them as the attacker. I might get caught, so I have to have a backup plan for both outside in access and inside out if you're using separate paths in and out of your target. Us, I cannot assume that just one machine I caught is the only, compromised, the only one compromised in my environment. I need to check to see if this attacker owns any other machines like it anywhere else on my network. If it was the attacker's only foothold, did they fall back to, attempt to, to attempting to re-enter after the initial compromise? Check carefully, carefully for any lateral movement from all affected endpoints. Leave no stone unturned. Next, them as the attacker. Understand how our tactics and procedures appear on the wire and on target machines. Example, the way that we deploy zero days and our custom tools might give us away. Track where each zero day that we use gets deployed and where each custom tool gets used. Assume the target captures full PCAP and actively analyzes that. For example, when I do recon, does the target know it's me because I do recon the same way every time? Us, as responders. Understand how intruder tools look when ran from both a network and host perspective. This also helps with actor attribution. They assume that we have full network packet captures and analyze that traffic. But don't just look at IPv4. Consider IPv6 and tunneling. Some high-end CNE operators do all of their exfil through tunnels because they expect you to be blind to anything other than IPv4. We don't leak out what we know. Don't let the adversary know what you know. Some actors, when they think they have been detected, will vanish. Share intel only with trusted and vetted partners. Next, them as the attacker. Encrypt wherever possible for tool transfer, C2, data exfil, everything. Us, as responders. Encryption makes my life a lot harder, but I need to understand my adversary might use it often and deal with it as best I can. Consider. Where do I have extra visibility through things like SSL termination? What can I tell before any encryption happened on any compromised source machine before that data ever got encrypted? Think RAM dump analysis. Can you see what commands were issued by the attacker in the RAM dump? Think file system timeline analysis. What files were touched before any encrypted tra network traffic happened? Can we build a way to decrypt by reverse engineering any captured tools? Next. We will cover a few points on how we, as incident handlers for APT matters, think about prevention and defense. First, put more kill in your kill chain. The cyber kill chain is a concept brought to us courtesy of Lockheed Martin. Basically, this kill chain model is a comprehensive seven-step framework to help you organize your approach to defending yourself against each stage of a typical attack. The kill chain is a useful framework to discuss attacks and organize your thoughts, but it needs to be used to its full potential. We need to stop damage as early in the kill chain as practical. 
We believe that a heavy focus on prevention is the right direction for incident response going forward. That is the kill part of it, not forever working the same types of intrusions. Is it really necessary to continue to pour more money and resources every year into security, forever banished to a world where our defenses fail? Or can we do better and reduce the number of successful attacks and damage over time? You can go a long way toward this goal by simply making sure that you patch everything that you have that is remotely exploitable across both, both your internet-facing assets and your client machines. On the client machines, you need to patch all your office components, common runtimes, media players and readers, in addition to the base operating system. And you need to keep all that stuff at patchable versions and service pack levels. For a simple example, you should not be running Windows XP anymore. Java, as we have discussed, is one of our current major pain points. So just patch, right? Or don't deploy Java runtimes on your Windows clients at all? Exactly, right. So what if you have to have Java in production, but you can't patch Java due to applications requiring certain Java versions to function properly? Are you done? No. Question, if you have unpatchable Java instances in production, have you taken this list of 17 Java CVEs to your network IPS people to make sure that you have block and notify coverage for each? Likewise, have you contacted your AV and HIPS vendor to confirm coverage for all 17? AV isn't dead, it helps in some cases. So what about EMET? Just so everyone is on the same page, EMET stands for Microsoft's Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit and is a set of mitigations that you can add on to Windows to help protect against a range of exploitation techniques. EMET is effective for prevention for many things if, one, you can deploy it without breaking production. Your experience may vary, but some, EMET sometimes needs a little tuning in some environments for a successful rollout. Two, you need to keep, you need to keep EMET patched and up to date. You cannot just deploy a particular version of EMET once and never touch it again. Example, if you rolled out EMET 3.0, that was great. But unfortunately, in 2013, there were at least two IE zero days that only EMET 4.1 would stop. EMET 3.0 wasn't effective against those. That trend has continued into 2014. You must run at least EMET 4.1. Now EMET 5 is coming out, which complicates the decision a bit more. Please take a look at this chart. This is from Microsoft's latest security intelligence report from May 2014. This chart shows what Microsoft says were vulnerabilities used in targeted attacks that were mitigated by EMET. Note what is not in this chart, any mention of a Java CVE. Here is a chart we showed you before from Microsoft's security intelligence report that we have overlaid with what EMET covers and what it currently doesn't. This shows visually roughly how much benefit you get from EMET. Looking at the bar on the far right-hand side of the chart, the red and green boxes at the top are IE and Adobe Flash, and the larger blue box below is Java. So this chart shows that EMET helps, but isn't a cure for everything right now, largely due to Java not being covered. And of course, EMET wouldn't help protect against your users being lured into running hostile straight EXEs, since EMET is a defense against exploitation attempts. So, how should you think about handling all those malicious office documents that we said earlier were, were a problem with targeted spear phishing? Why is that such a big problem? We, we suspect the reason is that we in IT are broadly failing to keep our populations of Microsoft Office installations patched. We think, by and large, everyone deploys Microsoft's monthly patches and keeps their operating system versions patchable, meaning running a supported major version and service pack level. What we don't believe is widely known is that Microsoft Office installations go off patching support fairly quickly after new service packs are released. For example, if you're running Office 2010 broadly across your organization, your installations with no service pack aren't receiving patches. Your installations running Office 2010 service pack one go off support in October 2014. It is important to keep Office both patchable, under support, and patched. If you recall earlier, we identified CVE 2012-0158 as being the number one type of malicious content we see and used in APT spear phishing against us since 2012. In many cases, the only thing that stopped an intrusion for us was the fact that our office installations are fully patched, not AV, not any other defensive layer. Patching works. It isn't an optional exercise. It isn't just busy work. Next, regarding the issue we mentioned earlier in the talk about third-party connections, what do you do about it? By and large, the same security measures that will work for you will work for them. 
So you might want to hold these partners to appropriate minimum security standards before they are allowed to connect to your network and require that they maintain those minimum standards for the entire period of time that your relationship requires any connectivity between your two networks. Also, know the security staff of these organizations. An active incident is not the time to be asking for contact names and phone numbers. Be prepared. Know what a breach coming over that partner connection would look like, what firewalls and IP addresses are involved. Monitor those connections. Maybe consider funneling third parties through a small number of network choke points. Doing that will make it easier to monitor them. Reduce the attack surface exposed from your own network, meaning limit the services and systems reachable through those partner connections. Don't expose your whole flat network to them if possible. Network segmentation works for both dealing with what is reachable from partner connections and within your own environment as well. Aside from looking for APT-specific indicators, we cannot think of anything that we are doing from a, a defense or prevention perspective that is uniquely applicable to a, only APT actors. In our experience, the exact same security practices and defenses are effective on both the APT side and non-APT side. Good security is good security. So, even if you don't think you have an APT problem, all the good things that you are doing security-wise to protect your environment will help defend against APT actors if they decide to attack you. The last point we wanted to touch on was um, a few point, points on your people. So, some people 101. You don't want to suppress or discourage ideas, especially from new or junior people. You want to continuously improve the, school, the skill level of everyone on your team. So, if a frontline SOC person misses an alert, which is better, and never talking to them about it or going over to them and kind of educating, on them, educating them on what they missed. You want to hold yourself to a high standard and continuously improve from there. You want to stay engaged and learn absolutely everything you can about your job every single day. You want to manage your people to a high standard and set them up for success. For example, you don't want your SOC to be constantly overwhelmed by false positives to the point where they might miss an actionable alert. A key point to keep in mind is that you can't depend on technology alone. Technology is only going to take you so far. Your people need to be, able to be well trained, supported, and they can't be overwhelmed. Your frontline staff needs to be listened to and respected, and your escalation paths need to work. Communication. You want to talk to your colleagues a lot. Some of us are introverts, but we need to take advantage of the experience and ideas of others. Um, that's pretty much where most of what we learn over our careers comes from, not training classes and not college, but the experience of those around you. You want to talk to your leadership. If you have concerns, um, are you being resourced correctly with the number of people and the amount of money and the tools that you have? You want to talk to your vendors. So if something's not working as it should or it needs a new feature, why don't you talk to your vendors and ask if that can be implemented? You want to talk to your red team and your internal pen testers. So from time to time, you, want, you might want to try asking them, what's the worst thing we're missing or not doing? The last time we did that, the answer surprised us, and it turned out they were correct. You also want to talk to your customers, who are the people that you're providing your incident response services to. Uh, we want to find out how you're doing through their eyes. And we do that by surveys. Do your customers think you are as good as incident response as you think you are? So as corny as it sounds, we found simple survey results to be invaluable. Sometimes your results are a little bit embarrassing, but there always seems to be a, at least a kernel of truth and even the worst feedback. And we tend to prefer anonymous surveys so we get the most honest feedback as possible. The lead into our survey, the question for our survey is on the screen. The Advanced Threats team strives to provide world-class world incident response services focused on preventing and stopping active APT attacks against GE network resources. Your feedback is critical to helping us ensure that we're meeting that goal. And then we go on to brief, briefly describe exactly what services our team provides. Then we ask for a single rating from 1 to 10 on how we're meeting their expectations and our stated goals with the space for freeform comments supporting that rating. So at the end of the day, the thing that makes our whole process work is great, passionate people. Uh, believe me, we're GE. We have loads of technology, processes, metrics, PowerPoint slide decks, and dashboards. But it isn't any of that that makes us truly effective. It's a core set of smart people that make all this happen. 
It's that smart, detail-oriented person who's mining Intel sources for us. It's that miracle factory that our malware reverse engineers operate for us. It's our razor-sharp, engaged, and energetic detection team getting appropriate alerting coverage out into production for us. And it's our vigilant SOC team not letting anything get past them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That's what makes it work for us. We believe that IT, IT security is not doomed to failure, to losing ground to adversaries, and suffering endless loss and damage. So it might not be able it might not be completely possible for us to ever completely win, but we can certainly raise the bar for attackers a lot higher. And one lesson you'll learn well over time in incident response is this, that all you guys do matters. Whether that's security policy, vulnerability management and patching, account management, locking down your endpoints, secure software development practices, or the building and maintenance of all your defensive layers, all of that matters. Um, this is our obligatory HR slide. <laughs> we are hiring. We work out of a relatively new GE facility here in Richmond in Glen Allen. So if you're interested in possibly working for, I, or for GE and IT security, you can go to ge.com slash infosec to learn more and see what positions we have open. Right now we have about 20 positions that we need to fill. And you can also go to ge.com slash careers to search jobs across all of GE. And our local GC, GE site is also on Twitter at GE InfoSec. In closing, we'd like to thank everyone at GE and elsewhere who has helped us and guided us over the years. If you have any feedback for us today, our Twitter handles are on the screen. And with that said, we'd like to thank you for your time and open it up for any questions. Thank you.